Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the second half of our mini symposium on integrated neurotechnologies. Our next speaker is Professor Jacob Robinson. Professor Robinson is an associate professor in electrical and computer engineering at uh, and bioengineering at Rice University, and an adjunct associate professor in neuroscience at Baylor College of Medicine. His research group uses nanofabrication technology to create devices that can manipulate and monitor neural circuit activity. Dr. Robinson graduated from the University of California, Los Angeles with a BS in physics in 2003 and entered the Applied Physics PhD program at Cornell University where he worked with Professor Michal Lipson, developing nanoscale silicon devices that can find light to small volumes and thereby enhance the interaction between light and matter. Upon completing his PhD in 2008, Dr. Robinson joined Professor Hong Kun Park's research group in the chemistry and chemical biology department at Harvard University. As a postdoctoral researcher, he helped develop arrays of vertical silicon nanowires that can penetrate the cellular membrane uh, without affecting cell viability. His work at Harvard showed that vertical silicon nanowires can be used to deliver biomolecules into a cell and interrogate a cell's internal electrical activity. His current research interests include nanoelectronic, nanophotonic, and nanomagnetic technologies to manipulate and measure brain activity. Dr. Robinson's work has been recognized by several agencies, including the DARPA Young Faculty Award and the John S. Dunn Foundation Co uh, Collaborative Research Award. So welcome, Jacob. Where do I talk? We're talking to this thing. You can just flip it too. Okay. The people on Zoom, if I if I don't use this, can people on Zoom hear me? Oh. How about now? Oh, uh, okay, great. Thank you so much for the introduction. And also, um, I'll say thanks to the organizers. This has been fantastic. I really enjoyed the first uh, few talks and I'm super excited for the rest of the day. I'm having a lot of fun. So um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, also, I will mention that this particular meeting, I think, is really special. I, it was one of the first kind of neuroengineering meetings I went to when I was starting out as an assistant professor back when it was Ant BI that uh, Menton organized. And it was this really nice place where engineers got together to talk about you know, neuro stuff. And now I really love the focus to bring more clinical people into the mix. Um, so compliments to everybody putting this together and keeping it going. Um, what I wanna talk about today is this idea of creating uh, miniature bioelectronic networks. But before I do, I wanna make sure I give a shout out to all the folks in my group who are the people who do all the work. Here we go, can you see that? Oh. You guys can't see the pointer. How about if I? Okay, now if I go over there. Oh, that's... okay. I'll try. Okay, so so these are all the fantastic folks who've been putting the work together. I'll put their faces up as we go along, um, but I want to kind of give you uh, a sense of, of who these people are, as well as the collaborators that I'll mention and the funding that we get from, uh, mostly from DARPA and NIH. I do also have a disclosure. Oh, you want to push that button? Okay, cool. Laser. Uh, I am not a Windows person. Okay, uh, slightly better, like ten percent better. Okay, um, I, I do also uh, forget um, disclosure. So, so I recently started a company with some uh, colleagues of mine called Motif Neurotech. So that's my financial disclosure. I'm on a professional leave. I'm starting it up. I have an equity stake, like like money or whatever. Um, mostly, it means that. Um, yeah, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, but I feel like you should do that anyway with academic talks. But yeah, anyway, um, yeah, we're starting this company. I'll tell you guys about it. Um, I'm on a partial week to, to get that going. Okay, so um, in addition to being able to work with those people, um, just to let you guys know where I'm coming from, uh, Rice University is in Houston. That's downtown Houston. This is the medical center, which is amazing. It's um, what they argue is the world's largest medical center. It's right across the street from the university. That's allowed us to kind of take this density of engineering that we have here with fantastic folks from across departments. These people should also be coming here. I think that um, Chong, Lon, Cal of Jersey, all really fantastic folks. Um, and we've been able to increasingly grow our ties with the medical community over here. 
and that has really influenced the direction both of my research as well as the, the research community at large. So if you ever have a chance to come out to Houston, make sure to stop by and, and we'll show you guys around. So the dream that I want to talk about today that we're trying to push um, with uh, the idea of network bioelectronics is that a lot of the systems that we're trying to interact with are distributed, meaning that there are places where I want to perform sensing, there are other places where I want to perform stimulation, they are not always in the same place. And oftentimes, as we heard earlier today, we want to push toward closed loop uh, systems, right, that can um, automatically adapt to maintain physiological set points. And here the example is in the peripheral nervous system, for example, um, for someone with spinal cord injury, if you want to control bladder or bowel, that might uh, be, have to be uh, controlled by the stretch uh, receptors in the stomach, right? We would want to control that system to measure how full an organ is so that we can control the muscles that would uh, regulate um, either bladder or bowel. And it might depend on whether or not you're seated or standing or what your blood pressure is. And this is an example of a distributed closed loop system that we would want to control electronically, therapeutically. Now, we could make the same case if you were to zoom in on the central nervous system in the brain distributed systems, uh, regions of the prefrontal cortex communicate with deeper regions. Um, we would similarly want to sense and stimulate perhaps at different locations to create a distributed network. And if we could do this, I think we could uh, be able to control organ function and even more of these uh, complex cognitive states like mood, memory, and, and other types of rehabilitation. Now, the challenge of doing this is, I think, an architecture challenge. So the devices that we have today to stimulate and record are based on um, uh, basically pacemaker type architectures where there is an implanted uh, pattern generator, an IPG that has a big battery pack, and then there's this header and connectors. And these connectors then go to the sites that you want to stimulate and record from. So you can imagine if I want to create this distributed system, right, I'm creating a wired network, right? Like, and I don't know if you guys have ever had to remodel a house. I did this recently, like putting wires into a existing uh, system is challenging and disruptive. So ideally, we would want a mesh network, a wireless network inside the body. And I don't want a bunch of these tin cans, right? I want to be able to make these things as small as possible. And so that's the dream. Now, in order to do that, the, a big challenge for miniaturization, we heard a little bit about power consumption. We didn't hear a lot about batteries, right? Because a lot of the systems that we're talking about were powered externally by cords, right? If I want to put them inside the body, I need to have batteries. Now, the problem is that we don't benefit from the Moore's law type scaling that we get from CMOS electronics when it comes to power consumption. Um, if I make a smaller battery, it just contains less energy and it can last for a shorter period of time. So what we can do is we can basically plot the volume of my implanted battery versus how long it can operate. The slope of this line will change based on the power requirements, but at some point, fundamentally, your battery will not last for more than 12 hours, 24 hours, whatever is a reasonable recharging amount of time. So there will always be a point where a uh, battery will not be sufficient for you to operate for uh, a reasonable amount of time to support a physiological function. In that regime, we need to create wireless power delivery technologies. And this could be energy harvesting, as we heard previously, uh, or it could be energy delivery through the body. And this is what we've been focusing on, because I think the amount of energy that we can get from the body is constrained in many ways. Um, if we could develop good wireless power transfer technologies, we could support much more advanced functionality if I wanted to have stimulation and recording and onboard processing, compression, some of the things that we heard about earlier today. Now, the challenge of doing this um, is the fact that power transmission through the body is extremely challenging relative to power transmission through the air. The analogy that I like to use, um, which I may have stole from Michelle Maharvitz, is the idea of you know, communicating with submarines. So if you guys watch like old World War II movies, I don't know why you would, uh, Hunt for Red October, maybe. There's like people in a, okay, Hunt for Red October got them. Okay, so right, the whole plot of the movie is that they cannot communicate from their submarine when they're underwater, right? So, I'm gonna, so they can basically make up a whole story of what they have to do. In order to communicate, they have to bring their submarine up to the surface because they cannot transmit electromagnetic waves through salt water. 
right? That energy is absorbed and reflected. The exact same physics is what limits our ability to transmit data and power through the human body. We basically have these tiny bioelectronic submarines that we're trying to communicate with, but the salt water is absorbing and reflecting that energy. And so we have to work with other forms of energy to communicate with these implants or to send power to them. Uh, there are many forms of doing this, right? There's some uh, really exciting work from these um, you know, other groups, near field communication, light, mid field, far field. I wanna highlight ultrasound because it also makes a great analogy with uh, submarines, right? So sonar works really great underwater, right? And so there's fantastic work from Ricky's group and others about using ultrasound as a way for, for power and uh, data transmission through the human body for exactly this reason of, of submarine communication. Now, we've been looking at a different technology called magnetoelectrics. And the reason why is that we love the ultrasound work and we were actually really inspired by it. But one of the challenges that we found is that communicating ultrasound or sending ultrasound waves through bone is really hard. Sending ultrasound waves through air is really hard. And so if I wanted to think about a system where I could have a transmitter that didn't need to be in physical contact with the body, and if I wanted to send information or power through bone, we thought magnetic fields would be a better approach for doing this in those particular applications. And now you might say, okay, there's many electrical engineers in the room. Uh, you guys can all imagine sending power with magnetic fields, right? It's magnetic induction. We, you know, if you have a power mat at home or an iPhone, that's what you're using to power your devices. And as a refresher, the way the magnetic induction works is that we create a magnetic field. That magnetic field then couples to uh, a pickup coil and that creates energy based on the amount of magnetic field that flows through the area of that coil. Okay. Now, here's the challenge for what we want to do to create, create these miniature in body submarines. The problem is that the amount of energy that I get depends on the area of that pickup coil. And unfortunately, power goes like the area squared. So it's r to the fourth power in terms of how much energy we can transmit. And that falls off like a cliff as we make these things smaller and smaller, right? The dimension to the fourth power. Now, instead, we kind of were inspired by this idea of ultrasound and, and mechanical vibrations. And we realized there are a class of materials called magnetoelectrics. They vibrate in the presence of a magnetic field. And this vibrational energy can get turned into electrical energy. The real advantage here is that it depends on the strength of the magnetic field, not the flux or the area of the magnetic field that I capture. This is the fundamental physical principle by which we can create efficient miniature bioelectronic devices that harvest energy and power. Uh, and we can plot this um, as a, and the key here is the scaling factor. So if I plot the area of my receiver and power transfer efficiency, if you do the same thing for amount of power, there's this crossover point where magnetoelectrics outperforms the very best inductive coupling. And by very best, I mean, we can go to the literature, we can look up decades of people optimizing inductive power transfer and plot the absolute best, I realize at this small scale, we outperform by a factor of five, and in some cases a factor of 10. And super exciting for me as a engineer working materials, this is a material property. So as I make better and better materials, I push this curve up. So I make uh, higher quality factors, better mechanical resonators. There's so much room for improvement. And I think we can really push both the power transfer efficiency as well as the power density. Okay, that was a physics lesson for the day. I think we're all done with physics. Okay, no, I, I lied. There's gonna be more. Okay, second thing that we discovered, kind of a surprise for us, but also super exciting, is that because it's not the flux that we care about, but the strength, we get incredible misalignment tolerance. What that means is that I can bend and tip my device. I can move it back and forth underneath that magnetic coil, and I can still have um, extremely high power transfer efficiency. This is really critical for us from a usability standpoint. It's not why we did it. We did it because we thought there were like really great things in terms of the amount of power, but the usability factor, the misalignment tolerance turns out to be incredibly important when we started to actually talk about practitioners. Um, this is just quantit uh, quantitative comparisons, both the angular misalignment tolerance as well as the lateral misalignment tolerance is, is extremely good compared to inductive coupling and ultrasound in part because ultrasound uses traditionally a focused beam. And so if I'm away from that focused beam, I'm not efficiently coupled, but because we can't focus magnetic fields, it's actually kind of a lemonade out of lemon situation where we get this really robust misalignment tolerance. Okay, second physics lesson. This is a resonant phenomenon. So what that means is that there's a particular frequency at which this power transfer is maximized. We're gonna use this later. So I wanted to bring it up now, but for now what we can do is we can show 
little fun tricks where we can power devices um, and we can detune the coil from the, these little resonators so that I have a control condition. In this case, what we did is we powered a deep brain stimulator. This deep brain stimulator is battery free. It fits on the tip of my finger. Uh, it's not my finger. I think that's, that's, um, that's not Kyle's finger either. That's Amanda's finger. Um, what it is connected to is basically a biphasic stimulator and it's you, uh, stereo trills down here. And this goes into the medial forebrain bundle and makes the rat feel happy when it's turned on. And so what we see is that this tiny little deep brain stimulator uh, causes the rat to hang out in this coil where he feels good. We can slightly detune it. Now it's off resonant. The rat figures it out. It doesn't feel good anymore. It feels good right over here and he moves over there. So this is basically a demonstration for us really for the first time that we came from a concept of like, hey, this is cool power transfer <laughs> and actually created this miniature battery free deep brain stimulator, um, which can be fully implanted in a, in a, uh, in a rat. Now, this is kind of an analog system. It's not nearly as fancy as the kind of CMOS stuff that you guys have heard about um, today, but we realized that that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. Based on this wireless power transfer technology, you can probably take the next step and start to add digital. And the way that we do this is coming back to the physics lesson is that we can slightly modulate that transmitting field uh, on and off resonance to create a digital bit sequence that we can use to program a custom ASIC. And that ASIC, can then set the stimulation parameters. And now we're actually creating kind of like a real biomedical device that can be both powered and programmed remotely. Once we can do that, we realize that we can really make a miniaturized form factor. And maybe we can start to do like weird, cool, like minimally invasive stuff. And we thought maybe we could go toward endovascular type bioelectronics. Electronics could be so small they could be implanted into blood vessels. Um, what we ended up doing is making something that was about uh, two millimeters across, five millimeters long. It could be delivered through a catheter. Um, in most cases, it's still a little bit too big to be in the vessel itself. So what we typically did is we deposited it near the vessel, took a lead electrode um, into the vessel here through this catheter, and then we can direct it to targets, nerve targets that would be really difficult to reach with a traditional surgical approach. In this case, you can kind of see it deposited here. This is about the size, but just for context here, um, two millimeters is like this. So this is about the size of a grain of rice, the entire device. Um, you can see here's the material for powering and there's uh, the tiny ASIC. This was uh, developed by Kaiwan Yang, a close collaborator of PI uh, in electrical engineering. And the only other component here is a capacitor that stores the energy. Uh, one of the nice things we're able to do with this is, um, you know, I wanted to basically make devices that could be maybe really used in real life. And so we started working with uh, clinical collaborators, Sunil Sheth, Peter Khan, and eventually Samir Sheth. Um, and we took this into the OR. This is, this is a pig experiment. And for those of you who, you know, engineers who don't do this or do do this, you realize once you go to the OR, you're like not allowed to touch the stuff anymore. So you have to make your system robust enough to hand over to a neurosurgeon uh, who's going to try and fiddle with this for 30 minutes in the OR. And so this idea of uh, misalignment tolerance, I think, is incredibly important for these kinds of applications. And so this was uh, Sunil holding our wand with a magnetic coil transmitter. We're stimulating the nerve that comes off of the DRG here. This is a potential uh, therapeutic target for chronic pain. And you see that we can stimulate the nerve um, so strongly, actually, that we can drive chest wall uh, contractions here. You'll see on the EMG, and there was a video that I was showing you earlier. Um, one of the advantages of having this high power transfer efficiency is that we can then create a wearable transmitter system with a battery pack that's about the size of an iPhone with approximately 30 hour battery life continuous operation. And this thing could all be integrated into a wearable. So we're beginning to think about this hybrid system where you know, we think back to that original architecture where I told you we had that tin can with leads and batteries that were implanted. And we're thinking, hey, what if we had grain of rice type individual modes that could be distributed and then a wearable system that could be upgraded or recharged or reconfigured uh, without having to change any of the implanted devices. And taking a step further, we realize that, look, you know, that, that misalignment tolerance also gives us the ability to create networks, right? It's going to scale up in the distributed system because that magnetic field is being distributed everywhere under that coil. One of the nice things about this is that when I talk about the power transfer efficiency, that might be 1% for an individual device, but if I add two or three or four devices under that same coil, I'm not creating an additional load on that transmitter. 
So what was a 1% system power transfer efficiency could become a 5 or 10% system power transfer efficiency just by scaling up the number of nodes. So there is actually this really nice scaling that we get. As a proof of principle, um, we took four of these devices, powered them by a single coil, and we put them into um, the RAT spinal cord here in Doug Weber's lab at CMU. And we were able to show that we can uh, individually control these, um, these magnetoelectric powered modes. The way that we do this is that each one of these has a unique digital identifier. So basically we broadcast a name to device one, two, three, or four, and then those devices can be programmed to do independent stimulation. You can see that we, we can recruit um, different muscle groups depending on which ones that we're talking to. There's no time around here. Three minutes? Okay. And so this all was coming together, but there was a piece that was missing that I think was really important. In this three minutes, I'll try and, try and mention that missing piece. The missing piece was getting data back. So one of the things that we saw that was really beautiful about the work with ultrasound is that because it's a propagating way, we can ping a device, we can get the reflected signal, we can get information back so we have this bi-directional link. We didn't really have that for magnetoelectrics because I have this magnetic field I'm transmitting and it's being absorbed and I can send data down, but I couldn't get it back. Um, oh, I forgot there's one cool video here. Um, yeah, we, we can also do this on a beating heart. That's kind of gross. But one of the nice things about misalignment tolerance here is that you can see that we're simultaneously powering these, these two implants. We can actually control pacing and kind of a distributed system. So anyway, that was cool. Uh, okay, back to uh, bi-directional communication. So uh, we really wanted to be able to get data back to create these closed loop systems. We didn't really know how to do it. But thinking back to the physics, these are resonators, right? These are like a tuning fork. So these tuning forks, if I ping them, they're actually gonna to continue to ring even if I turn the field off. And the idea is that maybe we could, um, we could shift that resonant frequency in a low power way just by adding a load to it. It turns out if you add a capacitor to this, it switches that resonant frequency. And what that means is that when I ping this device, I turn the magnetic field on, I turn it off, I can listen to that ring down. And then whether or not there's a capacitor attached to that, uh, film will change that resonant frequency. So I just have to listen to that resonant frequency and I can get digital data back. This is, I'm, I, don't, I don't have enough time to talk about it. Really excited about this work. It just came out um, in uh, a couple of months ago at, at Mobicom, Fatima presented this work, actually one of the best papers, which is great. Um, what we're able to do basically is, is count how many cycles we measure after each ping and, take, and measure the amount of time it takes to get to a specific number of cycles. If it's a short period of time that becomes a zero, a long period of time that becomes a one, that's our digital data back. It's not super high bandwidth for getting about uh, two kilobit per second back, but for what we're measuring, and if you get good data compression, that might be sufficient for a lot of applications. Here we are demonstrating a bit error rate around 10 to the minus five through a 15 millimeter porcine tissue um, at near that two kilobit uh, per second data rate. So the last maybe minute that I have, I want to talk about what we're doing. Um, basically, we, we, we put all these things together and we're like, wow, we have really a platform technology for, I think, really exciting bioelectronic type devices. Got excited about perhaps creating bioelectronic platform. And so we started this company back in April with the idea that if we could make uh, neural implants minimally invasive, we might be able to open up opportunities for people who would be otherwise hesitant for um, neuromodulation type therapies. So in about you know, 30 seconds, whatever, um, the devices that we're building have no batteries or powered by these magnetoelectric films for bi-directional communication. And the idea is that we could place devices above the dura in a 20 minute procedure flush with the surface of the scalp. And that could be an outpatient procedure. So we take what would be like a pretty invasive deep brain stimulation approach and, and make it a lot, hopefully more um, accessible and, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, approachable uh, for, for patients. And there are a number of targets that we can look at. We've been looking mostly at cortical targets, but many cortical targets are part of deeper circuits. And so um, one of the areas that we're interested in is uh, treatment resistant depression where there are known cortical targets, um, which have been shown to be really effective. And so we think because outpatient type of hybrid solution might be an opportunity for us to, to build these types of um, technologies. Um, I will say neuroethics is a word. Um, I, I bring it up because it's a real big part of IEEE and I'd be remiss if I didn't, please um, take some time. Um, if you're interested, I'm happy to talk to you more about it. There's an ongoing effort and we're looking for more people to help. Um, and the last thing, um, which I'll just maybe 
I can't find it. Oh, oh no, no, no. Okay, two, two, two very quick things. One, I'm biased, right? I love magnetoelectrics. They're super interesting. I think they're really powerful. They're not great for everything. Um, so we we try to do our best to make a, a review, and it shows kind of the various advantages. Basically, there are awesome opportunities for every type of wireless power transfer technology. What well, magnetoelectrics is not the best thing for everything. That's my my caveat. And last thing is, you know, I think what I'm really excited about is that you know, uh, Ricky was talking about, I added this slide at the last minute, Ricky was talking about this idea of like the, the battery power pacemakers, like the metronome circuit, and that's where it all came from. And this is basically like, if I showed you that picture of the DBS thing, that's the same architecture from 1957. Now, the thing I'm going to add to this is that in 1957, the global market for cardiac pacemakers was estimated to be 10,000 people in the world. Today, there's over a million sold annually. And it's not just cardiac pacemaking, right? Once we created a different form factor, we started looking at deep brain stimulation, spinal cord stimulation, lots of different things that we could support. And so I hope that as we move toward this kind of wireless power distributed network, the same thing's gonna happen. It's gonna be application you didn't even think about being supported by a new type of architecture. So I'll shut up now. Okay. Any questions? Okay, question. So, I'm from UCSD. Thank you for a fantastic talk. So, uh, I have questions related to your, uh, you know, the, uh, the basically the piezoelectric uh, part. You said that it's not dependent on the flux, right? Correct. But how about this? What is that, does that depend on the size of the electric uh, of, of the piezoelectric for the power? Yes. And the distance from this, the, the, the radiator from the source outside? Yes. So the answer to both those questions is yes. Um, so it depends on the strength of the magnetic field. And so that's going to fall off basically based on the, the geometry of your transfer coil. Mm -hmm. And that falls off as a pretty steep function, but we're the rule of thumb is about the radius of that coil is how far we can transmit into the tissue. And so we're in a few centimeter range. The second part of your question is how does it fall off with size? And yes, as we get smaller, we transmit less power, but the, um, the scaling for that is approximately linear with area as opposed to, to the square of area. And the reason why is because it basically is a charged capacitor that I'm basically charging and discharging. And so as a capacitor gets smaller, the area gets smaller. But when a coil, it goes like area squared, and that's where there's that fundamental difference. So, so you mean area, not volume, or for the uh, No, no. For both, the, the, this is an apples to apples comparison. Area or not, and not volume. No, I do. So when I compare to a coil, I'm comparing to a, so basically I'm saying, okay, if I had a two by six millimeter coil and a two by six millimeter film, how much power do I get from the film versus the coil? And it's 10x more power in the film. So we have a question on the chat as well. Does the resonance of the magnetoelectric material drift with temperature and other environmental changes? Oh, good question. It will certainly shift with temperature. These are going to be in hermetically sealed packages. Um, the, the Q factors are not particularly high. They're on the order of 40. So small fluctuations in those don't really affect our power transfer. Yeah. Okay, I saw, I saw a few hands up, but I'm only going to take one more. Um, I should mention that uh, we're going to have a technology development and commercialization panel tomorrow. Both Jacob and Carolina are going to be uh, part of that panel, and they'll both be around both days. So please hunt, hunt them down if you have further questions. Really, really fantastic talk. So it was really cool. Um, I'm just curious if you thought about mitigation strategies for what would happen in an MRI. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> so um, as best we can tell, it's going to be MRI safe. Um, now, the things that we worry about would be um, like, are you going to power your device or like, to make it do weird things. The frequencies are so far from the MR frequency that we're not worried about it. There's a small ferromagnetic property of the material itself, which could cause movement, but the way that it's packaged in the device and anchored to the skull is going to mitigate any of that. If you look at cochlear implants, cochlear implants have like rare earth magnets on them, and those are MRI safe. You just wrap your head up in like a little towel to keep it from moving. So I think it really depends on how you anchor your device in terms of its MRI safety. Now, there will be an artifact around but you see artifact around any kind of implant. So I think we're kind of in the ballpark of traditional implants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Great, let's thank Jacob. And also, thank you for neuroethics. I wanted to mention that we're going to have a neuroethics presentation tomorrow afternoon. Okay, so our next speaker is, let's see if I can find my notes. Oh, here we are, Professor Flavia Pizzale. <laughs> okay, she's an assistant professor of neurology and physical med medicine and rehabilitation at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also a core faculty member of the Center for Neuroengineering and Therapeutics, Brain Science Translation, Innovation and Modulation, and of the Translational Center of Excellence for Gene and Molecular Therapy at Penn and the Center for Neurotrauma, Neurodegeneration and Restoration at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center. Her research interests focus on flexible bioelectronic materials and devices for high resolution, minimally invasive neural recording and stimulation. A native of Rome, Italy, Dr. Vitale earned her BS and MS in biomedical engineering at the Università Campus Biomedico di Roma in 2008. In 2012, she received her PhD in chemical engineering uh, at the Università di Roma, La Sapienza. Dr. Vitale uh, completed her postdoctoral training at Rice University, where she worked on high-performance biomaterials and bioelectronic interfaces based on carbon nanomaterials, followed by a neuroengineering research training in the Penn Center for Neuroengineering and Therapeutics. Well, thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you, Ricky, for um, the introduction. Congratulations for your perfect um, spotless Italian pronunciation. <laughs> um, um, I mean, seriously. And um, yeah, and thank you so much for inviting me to, to speak here um, today. It's a great uh, pleasure um, to share um, our recent work, recent work on multimodal high resolution electronic interfaces um, based on soft nanomaterials and in particular vaccines. Okay, just one second. The computer is stuck. Oh. It's um, loading and freezing. I didn't do anything. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> it's local. It's local. <clears throat> it's just frozen. PowerPoint. Um, I think it might be Zoom. Zoom might have a memory leak on Windows. Yeah, is this the Zoom host? Can we not stop at this time? Oh, um, it just Microsoft hang up and it's fine. I guess I need to start again. Oh, it's win It's a Windows. Problem. Windows, yes. Let's try again. Are there like multiple, are there multiple PowerPoints open that are? No, I have my computer is needed. Recovery. That's okay, I guess. Right. This is fine. I can use this one. There may be a lot of PowerPoints open. Why is it? Why is it this one? Why is it this one? This one, right? Yes. Okay. So I, I, sorry, click to run the button. Yes. Okay, I'm 
I'm not gonna touch anything, just advance, okay? Sorry for the um, technical um, difficulties. Okay, so um, bioelectronic interfaces um, for neuromodulation as well as BCIs are um, widely spread, um, adopt, uh, wide, widely spread um, tools for um, restoring, replacing, and treating neurological and neuromuscular disorders. Now, Jeff has done like a great work uh, introducing neuromodulation and BCIs, uh, BCI interfaces, and also describing the differences and commonalities between the two types of technologies. So I will not go further into that, but thank you, Jeff, for making my job easier. Um, but what I want to say is that despite, um, regardless of the specific application, the both neuromodulation and uh, BCI devices uh, share a common uh, uh, system, a common tool at the, that sits right at the interface with electrically active circuits to restore, control, um, replace or modulate their function. And the system is the um, electrode. And yeah, despite decades of research and, you know, still like uh, significant efforts from also many of you um, here, there is still a fundamental mismatch between the electrochemical, mechanical, uh, chemical properties of the man-made electronics and biological uh, uh, systems. So for example, uh, biological tissues are soft and compliant. Uh, think about how the brain pulses at every heartbeat. Um, they, um, in this, uh, in, the biological tissue signals are conducted by flow of ions um, in an electrolytic medium, um, whereas traditional um, electro electronic components, on the other hand, are rigid and static. The signals in uh, um, traditional uh, conductors are conducted by flow of electrons of ions, and all the materials are inorganic, typically are silicon and metals. And in addition, uh, manufacturing these uh, devices rely on expensive and time-consuming processes that are typically borrowed directly um, with, uh, from the semiconductor industry, but that, does, that do not um, translate very easily if we start like thinking about adopting new materials. And so from, you know, as a chemical engineer, for me, this is a materials problem that maybe can be addressed by looking into other materials and expanding the library of materials for bioelectronics. So in the last few years in my lab, in this quest of you know, finding new uh, bioelectronic materials that could address the mismatch between biology and electronics, we started to um, work and explore the potentials of maxines. So the, ter the term maxines refers to um, actually a family of um, two-dimensional nanomaterials consisting in transi layer transition metals and um, carbon or uh, nitrogen cores, and with a surface decorated by oxygen, hydroxyl, or fluorine groups, depending on the synthesis process. Now, of the more of the 40 forms of maxines um, synthesized thus far, we have been primar uh, primarily investigating titanium carbide maxine because it was the first to be synthesized and the most conductive and most capacitive so far. Now, what makes um, maxines unique among other nanomaterials like carbon nanotubes and graphene that have been extensively investigated for bioelectronics is that they are stable in aqueous dispersions. This means I can take a maxine powder, mix it with water, and then I have a conductive ink that I can use to then print on any substrate without the need of um, harsh chemical and thermal conditions that is that these other uh, nanomaterials typically require. And this opens the uh, 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 wide range of opportunities for safe, high throughput, and scalable processing of these materials into um, um, multi-scale devices. So when we started to work with um, titanium carbide maxine, really there was no precedent of use these materials in any type of uh, uh, biomedical devices. So we had to come up with a process to uh, make, um, we started with neural microelectrode arrays. And the process really consists in conventional photolithography, lift off steps to end um, spin casting of maxine films to form microelectrode contacts onto a flexible pyrimidine substrate. 
And using this process, we came up with different um, device geometries um, from micro ECOG arrays to um, laminar arrays. And in this specific configuration, we decided to um, pattern Maxine side by side, very close to uh, gold content to uh, compare, to benchmark these new materials with no pun intended, uh, gold standard uh, materials. In vitro, in saline, we measured consistently a four, time lower four times lower impedance on maxine contacts than on uh, gold. And in vivo, uh, this reduced impedance resulted in a higher sensitivity for detecting um, extracellular spiking activity. Basically, we could record more spikes in vivo than on adjacent gold contact. And with uh, also additional characterization and modeling, we um, attribute, we can attribute now this enhanced sensitivity to the higher capacitance of Maxine compared to gold, but also to this like rough uh, nano microstructure uh, surface topology that is formed by overlapping Maxine flakes. We also demonstrated this, this material is safe to neurons. Neurons can grow in contact with Maxine and can also form functionally um, connected networks. Now I'm uh, in a neurology department. And so when I started to talk with my um, colleague in uh, clinicians, they started to ask me, okay, like, can we use these materials in our human subject research or on our patients? And the problem is that at the time, we really were stuck with a microfabrication, which is really um, suitable for fabricating um, very small devices with micro scale features, but really does not scale up. If we think about fabricating devices for um, covering large parts of the brains from centimeters, um, cent several centimeters square um, scales. Um, and really, um, microfabrication is also time consuming, expensive, and it's quite low throughput. So, uh, my uh, talented student at the time, I was now a postdoc at MIT, came up with this like very um, clever approach that is based on laser micromachining and absorbent substrate um, to form the electro contacts. The electro contacts are, the, are then inked with a uh, maxine. And then everything is encapsulated with um, an elastomer like PDMS or um, Ecoflex. And then we can open selectively the uh, vias by etching away the elastomer at the contact sites. And these devices um, um, are, um, these geometries can be used, for example, for epidermal uh, sensing. But and it was alluded by previous speakers before, when we have to make contact through the scalp, uh, through the hair, and um, sorry, make contact with the scalp through the hair, then the planar arrays are not ideal. And so for, um, I, uh, for EEG um, arrays, we added three-dimensional mini pillars that are made by um, a cellulose template infiltrated with uh, Maxine's. And then the rest of the fabrication process is exactly as the same as I just described. And so this process is really quick, um, low throughput, uh, high throughput, um, uh, very cost effective. We can make tens of different devices in a day, really the uh, um, um, most time consuming step is the curing of the elastomers. And we can fully customize with this process, the um, device geometry, morphology and coverage. And here is just, I just wanted to give a quick closer look at the morphology of these arrays um, at the conductive cellulose traces that are well interpenetrated with the Maxine flakes and also at the very highly porous and rough um, interface of this three-dimensional mini pillars for um, EEG recordings. So we uh, um, initially benchmarked um, our uh, Maxine base arrays, which we also in this configuration we call max roads, to uh, planum eco grids. And in sailing, again, due to the morphology of these devices, the high surface area and the higher capacitance of Maxine, we found 20 times higher, 20 times lower impedance of Maxine contacts compared to platinum contacts. And also the, the ability, much uh, enhanced ability of store charge at the interface that can be then used, for example, for electrical stimulation. Um, the, um, when we looked at the electrochemical uh, water window, so the safety limits, um, 
um, of afforded by this material, we found a quite uh, a wide um, um, window limit in the cathodic range. Um, and um, in an Nordic range, the limit is comparable to that of uh, platinum and, and gold. Um, and the charge injection capacity um, is comparable to or higher than um, organic polymers and metals and comparable to among the best um, 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 novel nanomaterials presented for simulation like porous graphene and uh, P dot CNT and platinum composites. Now, because of this like, pretty promising um, electrochemical properties in saline, we hypothesized that maybe we could um, uh, use these electrodes for dry epidermal sensing. So we could basically get rid of the gels that is typically at the interface with epidermal electrodes to reduce um, the impedance with the skin without uh, losing on the impedance and signal quality. And so when we compare the impedance at, um, at the skin interface of our electrodes compared to gel the clinical electrodes, we found that at one kilohertz, the impedances are comparable. But in the one to 100 um, kilohertz range, hertz, one to 100 hertz range, where the um, majority of the um, uh, um, of where the uh, majority of the, the power of the signals that emerge on the skin can be detected. Actually, in this uh, frequency range, the impedance of our electrodes was about 10 times lower than that of um, gel natus electrodes. Now, in the previous, uh, uh, after the previous talk, the, what the question of magnetic compatibility was brought up, right? And so we also investigated the imaging compatibility of these materials. Can we take these materials um, uh, in, you know, um, MR or CT uh, scanners and um, do imaging without uh, significant artifact or image distortions. So we knew that Maxine is a low density material. And that means that it does interact very weakly with the X-rays in the CT scanners. And that means that it does not give rise to that scattering artifact that is very evident around the high density materials like platinum. What we didn't know and we, uh, uh, investigated in this work is that Maxine is a weakly paramagnetic material with a magnetic susceptibility that we measure is much closer to that of human tissue than uh, metals. And that means that even in high field MRI, that, uh, there is almost no artifact around the Maxine electrodes, whereas platinum can induce very severe artifact. And in fMRI, which has even, these sequences have even, uh, even higher uh, or more stringent requirements in terms of susceptibility artifacts. Um, we, I had to, to draw here the outline of the uh, Maxine arrays on the forehead of a participant, because actually uh, we did not see, we could not even see where the device uh, was also at, you know, different, uh, uh, slices. We also measure the or monitor the temperature around the electrodes during the scans, and we did not see any significant um, temperature increase. The um, first application that we looked at is um, uh, dry EEG. Um, and for this application, we use the, eight, the circular eight array um, electrodes with three-dimensional mini pillars. We uh, place this array in the um, occipital area of um, the participant's scalp. And at the center of it, we place a clinical gel electrodes. And when we look at impedance, we found that despite the fact is that, that these electrodes are um, about 60% smaller, um, sorry, 30% smaller than the central uh, gel electrode, the impedance is comparable. We also looked at the EEG and the two signals detected with the two type of uh, arrays look virtually indistinguishable, not only at the selected location, but across actually the entire array. And the signals are also very, very similar in the frequency domain, both in you know, resting state, eyes open, but also in eyes closed condition, where we saw the characteristic <laughs> enhancement of the power in the alpha band. And so now that we have this technology, we can like start um, um, asking some interesting questions, right? For example, if we 
push the limit on the density of EEG can, um, and the size of the EEG electrodes? Can we start maybe detecting uh, spatiotemporal patterns of a brain activity um, even at a millimeter or submillimeter scale? So like what is the limit of, the limit of EEG? Um, uh, from um, in high density configuration. So we just started to look into this, but this video that I'm showing, for example, um, is uh, on the top has the just the EEG trace from the electrode outlined in yellow. But you can see here, and this is uh, the power on each electrode in the alpha band during this time frame of the video, that there is a clear spatial temporal organization of alpha activity. Um, and so we are starting again to look at um, this like questions at the um, uh, smallest scale that we can um, pattern our uh, dry EEG electrodes. We also demonstrated the applicability of MAXROADS to intracortical recording and stimulation, uh, which is routinely conducted in, during neurosurgical procedures. Um, for cortical recordings, we map the spontaneous activity in a pig model, in this case of a traumatic brain injury, with a six channel micro ECOG array. Each channel is about 500 micron in diameter. Um, also in this case, we even in this like very small uh, cortical area, we found stereotypical activation patterns where we mapped the um, amplitude on each uh, of the signals on each electrode and these activation patterns were uh, pretty much phase locked to the um, um, high and low states of the um, micro ECOG signals. And uh, in terms of cortical simulation, this is just like very preliminary data that demonstrate the feasibility of cortical micro simulation with Maxine microelectrode arrays. So in this paradigm, we had the electrodes placed in the motor cortex um, of a rat in the area that controls whisker movement. And then we track the uh, uh, whisker uh, movement with an optical micrometer. We deliver simulation pulses at uh, different intensities and um, Luckily, we found uh, we were we we elicited um, the whisker movement, and as expected, the um, intensity of the whisker deflection is modulated, is controlled by the intensity intensity of the um, uh, stimulation. Now, um, I, this is the last few minutes of my talk. I want to um, shift the gears a little bit and present um, a different application of this technology in um, high density surface EMG. And this, um, I, I think it was still relevant to present, you know, work that was not necessarily related to brain mapping, but to neuromuscular mapping, because surface EMG is um, uh, becoming an in, in more important component of motor BCIs, uh, robot control, rehabilitation, myoelectric prosthesis, and it's been also investigated maybe to control the metaverse in the future. So um, leveraging the scalability um, and the versatility of our um, fabrication process, we designed devices that could array. So this is a 78 channel array that covers completely the, the muscles in the calf. Um, and we asked 10 participants to walk on the treadmill and we recorded um, the EMG for all the 78 channels on the treadmill. Now, of course, we to validate and also benchmark the quality of our recordings with this um, high density surface EMG, again, in dry configuration, we um, um, acquire the EMG also with a commercial wireless system. So the deltas that consist in those like black pods, each of those pods has two sets of bipolar channels placed and we looked at the signal in uh, corresponding uh, locations. And so what we found is that the signal to noise ratio is comparable with, between the deltas, which is also wireless. And at the time our system was wired um, at the back shoot. Um, we also, the, the traces, the um, um, root mean square of the signals are highly correlated throughout the entire phase of the gate. And that we also find a much um, higher spatial resolution. So in our recordings, we could see um, uh, changes in muscle activation of about 40% throughout the muscle surface that could not be detected by um, a much larger 
um, EMG array. And so just to, to conclude um, this, this uh, presentation, we also used our EMG in conjunction with the simple support vector machine algorithm to predict the phase of the gate cycles, wing versus stance in you know, five participants. And we were able to predict with um, the, the phase of the gate with very high accuracy, more than 90% in all of our participants. And this is, you know, it opens up the applications of this technology in uh, myoelectric control prosthesis, for example, but also BCIs. Okay, I just want to conclude. I'm not going to take uh, more of your time, but I hope I convinced you in this 20 minutes or so that maybe expanding the library of materials and then the developing novel fabrication processes, we can really um, uh, propose novel bioelectronic technologies that could allow us to study neurological and neuromuscular disorders, but ultimately also improve patient uh, outcomes. With that, I thank you all for your attention. I acknowledge my talented students, my funding sources, and happy to take any questions. Thank you for the talk. Uh, have you felt or have you planned on developing a bone factor such that these sensors could uh, reach the scalp and hair? Yes, so in our preliminary studies, we did record from people with hair, um, although, you know, very sparse. Um, and now, actually, my student Sneha Shankar is in, in the audience and she can talk more about all the work that she's doing in this field. She's um, expanded and improved the fabrication approach to uh, make mini pillars that can very easily um, uh, make contact with scalp with a scalp through hair like mine um, and achieve a very low impedance, like 10 kilo ohms or so. So we're absolutely working on that aspect because it's one of the most challenging you know, problems that we need to address. Um, I have a quick question regarding like the longevity of the electrodes and what is the, the susceptibility to corrosion or any form of like degradation of the pump over time? Yes, so this is a really good question. Um, Maxine's, um, the, the stability of Maxine's depends a lot on the synthesis process and on the surface terminations. Um, in some forms of Maxine's, um, it can uh, oxidize, especially if there are defects um, at the atom level and so oxidation and hydro hydrolysis and non-oxidation can start from those defects and ultimately basically you go from maxine to titanium oxide, right? Um, we are um, luckily um, um, using very high quality of maxine, which is like much more stable than other forms of maxine. How, and in addition to that, these uh, devices are like composites, right? You have Maxine infiltrated within an absorbent substrate, and then everything is encapsulated with, the, with elastomer. And so in, we are testing the durability of our devices right now, but we found that shelf life, um, we have not seen any significant change in impedance for over 20 weeks, leaving these devices in air. And in um, aqueous conditions, actually, we just started this experiment. So we are now 120 weeks, and we're not see 100, sorry, 120 hours, and we're not seeing any change in the uh, materials properties. And so these are pretty good signs that, at least in the time scales that are relevant for epidermal uh, sensing and shelf life of devices for epidermal sensing, but also for intraoperative recording and stimulation, which occurs acutely, these devices are, are you know, their, their durability and stability is actually adequate to meet those requirements in these applications. We have more questions. I think we're going to. We're going to cut it off I'm happy. in the interest of time. Flavia will be around. Please, please be sure to ask her questions during the lunch. Thank you so much, Flavia. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Khan Dagdevarin, who will be giving her talk remotely. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes. So let, okay, me, let me introduce our speaker. 
Professor Kananda Devran is an Associate Professor of Media Arts and Sciences and the LG Career Development <laughs> Professor of Media Arts and Sciences at the MIT Media Lab, where she leads the Conformable Decoders Research Group. The group aims to convert the patterns of nature and the human body into beneficial signals and energy. Dr. Doug Deverin earned her PhD in material science and engineer from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she focused on exploring patterning techniques and creating piezoelectric biomedical systems. Her collaborative, or her, I'm sorry, her collective PhD research involved flexible mechanical energy harvesters multifunctional cardiac vessel stents, wearable blood pressure sensors, and stretchable skin modular sensing bio patches. Cool. Thank you so very much for the kind uh, introduction.